can see the number of participants is leveling out. So cool. Let's get started then. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today, wherever you're dialing in from in the world. Um, my name is Ben McCarthy. I'm founder at salesforceben.com, and I'm going to be your host for today. And we're going to be talking about understanding AI and Salesforce DevOps. So uh, as I, I'm sure we all know, you know, AI is the big thing at the moment. Forget NFTs, forget crypto, forget the metaverse. Uh, AI is what is what everyone is very excited about at the moment. And you can kind of see why, because it, unlike NFTs, crypto, the metaverse, we people are using AI in their jobs today and becoming instantly more productive. So I think it's very important that we take a step back and have these conversations around how AI can improve different industries, products, um, or something like DevOps, which combines processes and tools. So that is what we're going to be talking about today. And I'm going to hand over to Zach and Lars now, who are going to be having the conversation. And I'm going to come back at the end for the Q&A. Uh, you should be able to access the Q&A at the bottom. Um, and uh, yeah, you can ask questions throughout and we'll get around to them at the end. So Zach, over to you. Thanks so much, Ben, and appreciate you putting this event on, this webinar for us. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. And as Ben mentioned, you know, we're here talking about the, the hot topic of the day as it applies to Salesforce and Salesforce DevOps. Uh, my name is Zach Taylor. I work at AutoRabbit as an enterprise account executive. So I get to work with all different kinds of businesses, primarily in uh, regulated enterprises to help them uh, design and make more efficient, speed up and secure their Salesforce pipeline. Um, Lars, if you want to introduce yourself as well. Of course. Um, so my name is Lars Melmqvist. I am a partner at uh, Implement Consulting Group. Um, I'm also a Salesforce CTA, Certified Technical Architect, and um, I wrote a book uh, called Architecting AI Solutions on Salesforce. Wonderful. And there are our nice pictures if you want to take a look at that. But as we get going today, uh, we've got three main agenda points that we want to get through before we get to the Q&A. So first, just looking at the current state of AI uh, and its applications in Salesforce and Salesforce DevOps, then looking at some of the potential challenges as well as opportunities and applications uh, that we're seeing either right now or down the line. And then lastly, looking at uh, how do we safely address AI's use within our Salesforce pipelines and across the Salesforce ecosystem. Um, we are working to get this right around 30 minute mark. So expect us to talk through things for about half an hour and all of your questions are being monitored and then we'll go uh, answer those at the second half. And with that, uh, I think we can kick off looking at the current state, right? So to begin with, right, AI, very very broad application set, uh, but for today's conversation, we're going to be focusing on uh, large language models. You may have heard in the news or seen something about generative AI, which is typically referring to uh, applications where someone can put in a prompt into some type of AI, and it's going to generate images, videos, uh, and something of the sort. For us, the large language models are the most applicable right now in Salesforce, where you're able to, say, create this flow for me or modify this trigger, and it's going to actually spit out some Apex code or some JavaScript or some type of code that is uh, applicable to what you're asking it to do. Um, Lars, you want to talk about those differences a little bit as well? Yeah, no, I I, I do. I mean, it's, it's important to understand um, that, you know, there's a difference between large language models, right? If you look at it, if you look at the landscape, there's actually a whole slew of different models that are coming out at the moment. There is, uh, you know, new open source models coming out uh, and being trained every day, um, a lot of them off uh, the Facebook uh, Llama based model. Um, then there's obviously the big gorillas in the um, in the field, that's, uh, you know, the open AI chat GPT um, and core, core GPT models. And, uh, and of course, the Google's Bard um, competitor. And those are probably the ones that most of you will have have been using if, you, if you've been using this. Uh, this is all because they're, you know, consumer facing. And then there's, you know, variants on that theme from different providers. Um, for instance, Salesforce, right? So Salesforce has a some proprietary models, uh, one called CodeGen, for instance, for code generation in Apex. Um, that's specifically the tailored to that. And um, all of these models are 
effectively doing the same thing, right? They're taking a a prompt, they're taking uh, some text, and based on that text, they're generating new text, right? Or you know, if it, it's a it's a diffusion model, it would be generating an image, but we we don't need mm -hmm. to consider that uh, that yeah. tonight. And then um, the better you um, like, the larger the model and the more data you put into it, um, pretty reliably, the better it gets. Um, and you know, that has been what we've been seeing over the past few months, where um, scaling these models up and finding better ways of uh, of training and fine tuning them is um, is great. Sort of creating this surge of innovation um, and uh, and applications that we're 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 seeing at the moment. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Lars. And thinking about the current state, this will only get better. So what you guys are seeing right now, uh, compared to what this is going to look like in six months, uh, twelve months, eighteen months is going to be far further along and that is that's based on just how ai works right it's based on you inputting more data uh, and the more questions that it has to answer the more data that it gets trained on the better that model is at you know doing what you needed to do it's seen more and therefore it has more knowledge and therefore it can make you know more predictive analytics write better code things of that nature so we expect this to increase and increase in in uh in performance. And I'll also mention that outside of Salesforce, large language models are being applied in other uh, other code uh, code languages as well. So not just in Apex and in you know our web-based languages that we see in Lightning web components, but also we're seeing this applied in Python and C++ and, and all kinds of other languages. Just for today's conversation, we want to talk about how we're seeing it used with Salesforce. Lars, I know we talked a little bit before. Which one are, are you using right now? Uh, I know you've played around with a ton of them, Bedrock and Gemini, to, to mention a few of the smaller guys. But uh, for the big ones, and I mean, where are you spending your time and what are you messing around with right now? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I guess right now, like the, the dominant... Uh... Uh, you know, 800 pound gorilla are the open AI models in particular GPT-4. It is just mm -hmm. a class above everything else. Um, and uh, especially that is true for, for when you're generating code. Now that we, we should expect that to, to change. Um, and obviously one of the big problems with, uh, with GPT-4 at the moment is that we don't have access to, to do any kind of fine tuning or manip manipulation of it, right? So whenever we have to go and do something specific that is for our own uh, own use we if we want to fine tune it on a particular you know like salesforce wants to to do something that's specific to apex we want to do something that's specific to um writing documentation for code or uh understanding a particular kind of uh, of code problem uh, for static analysis or whatever we want to do then we we actually can't use um most of the models out there because they're not uh, they're not uh, available for commercial use so then you have to Look at some of the the open source models that have been trained on um, on relatively open data sets. So I, I want to see you know you know you're you're basically looking at at GPT four for cutting edge performance, and then you can take a pick of a range of other ones if you don't need cutting edge performance, and if you need to to fine tune your own model and uh, get it to do something specific to you, then you are looking at you know, one of the smaller open source models where the the licensing is permissive uh, in terms of commercial use. That's absolutely right. Yeah. And first poll question, I want <clears throat> to drop into the chat here um, about people's familiarity with AI as we kind of close out the current state piece. Um, we've talked a little bit about what kind of models have been uh, most most applicable right now, but we're also seeing the emergence of Einstein GPT. If you've been to any Salesforce events recently or you know, are, are monitoring the Salesforce ecosystem and what they're announcing, Einstein GPT is, uh, is the newest offering coming from Salesforce and how they want to implement uh, AI and make that available to their customers and make it available for you to use in both your development and also in your delivery to your customers. Um, Lars, I know you work with some customers who have been asking a lot about this. Uh, what have you heard? Well, I mean, we, we all hear, hear a lot of rumors, right? So, so what we know for a fact is that Einstein GBT is largely based on the, on the open AI models that I was just talking about. So GBT4 in particular. Um, 
And we know that because Salesforce have said as much that, uh, that a lot of it is coming from there. Then they're combining it with a bunch of their own models, um, in particular, this code gen model for Apex to generate Apex code better. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm gonna assume, although it wasn't stated explicitly that they're also doing something special on the, on the Tableau GPT side that they just announced, because I don't see how some of the use cases they're mentioning would be done with vanilla um, GPT-4, right? So it's, um, I, I guess the really, the really exciting thing about Einstein GPT is that these tools become available to us inside Salesforce where we work, right? It's gonna be right there um, on my opportunity record when I'm configuring a flow, when I'm writing some, uh, some Apex code, it's gonna be right there. Um, and available and it's going to be adapted to my particular use cases within Salesforce, right? So I, I, I want to say that, you know, there's going to be very little that Einstein GBT brings to the table that you couldn't in theory do with models that are out there already, but you would have to do the work yourself, right? Um, what, what, it, what it's going to do is it's going to bring it right into the, into the place where you work and, and it's going to make adoption just much more, um, much easier and, and enable it at a, at a much larger scale, right? So it, it, Einstein GPT completely changes the scale of adoption, uh, potentially if people um, uh, start rolling it out uh, at the rate that, that you'd expect. Right, that's, that's absolutely right there. And, and I mean, this is really why we're having this conversation is where are we gonna start to see this work into the day-to-day? -day? Uh, looking at the poll results here, looks like most folks on the call um, have, pretty limited familiarity with AI. Some have uh, seen a little bit of application and, and maybe touched you know, a little bit of the AI things that we're talking about. Uh, maybe they've played around in, in other AI models that are available throughout the web. Uh, but for most folks, this is a relatively new topic. But what we're seeing here is every company is trying to get these tools onto their, uh, onto their tech stack as quick as possible, or at least used in their development in some way. And why is that, right? Why are people so excited about this? Uh, there's a lot of different applications, but I mean, just to start kind of summing some of them up, if we think about the large language models with the ability to generate code, a developer who perhaps is responsible for producing, let's just say five user stories per week, and that's what they're currently able to do. If they're able to go to some large language model and input their user story or input some level of instructions, and then 80% of the coding is done for them, uh, all they're going to have to do is review that code, make some changes uh, based on you know what they see, maybe something the AI didn't write as well, maybe something specific to their company they need to adjust, but it has the potential to skyrocket productivity in a very substantial way for developers, admins. Um, we're already seeing these types of applications across software development, uh, including in Salesforce. Um, right now, and we'll get into this, but you know, how good is that code today? Depends on what you're asking it to do. Uh, depends on um, a number of things, but you know the code right now. There's still some challenges with what it's giving you, but it's absolutely usable code, right? It's very common now to see developers uh, ask ChatGPT, "Hey, can you write this uh, this Apex class for me?" And it's going to give you something that's at least a base. Uh, that you can work from, thus eliminating hours of work that you may have had to do before. Um, that's one really important application. I was on LinkedIn talking with some uh, IT directors that you know are, overlook their enterprise systems, including Salesforce, and they've even talked about uh, kind of a dream of having uh, this AI applied to their ticketing system, because some of these folks are using Salesforce as their ticketing system for customers. So they want some capability of ingesting those tickets, having that ticket uh, put through some type of AI model for you know automatic resolution, Again, I know that's not really getting into the large language model, but uh, those are a couple applications that came to the top of my mind. Um, Lars, what's 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 bugging you? What do you think it, it's going to be? Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, the, the, the obvious application is that we can produce code a lot quicker, right? We can produce code a lot quicker. We can produce, te produce tests a lot quicker. We can produce documentation a lot quicker. Right? That's what this, uh, this fundamentally does. And it, it does work, right? It, it, and it even, you know, like it's... It even works well enough that sometimes you can just take what's there and uh, and and plug it in, and it 
and it runs. Now, how big of a productivity gain that is obviously depends on how much of your total um, cycle time is spent in producing code, right? You know, relative to producing the requirements, thinking about the problem, defining the problem precisely, you know, uh, putting it through your pipeline, testing it, uh, validating it, and, and then getting it out to production. Like how big a part is the actual, you know, production part of that cycle um, versus the, the, the process steps, the discussions, the, 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 the thinking about it, that will sort of tell you how big of a productivity boost that's potentially there. And it is important to note that, you know, we are not at a stage where it's just gonna look at a user story and produce the, the result you need. It's not, it's, it's not quite that good in most cases, unless your story is very simple, right? Because you also, you have a code, existing code base, you have uh, technical patterns that you need to follow, you have um, ways that your code already works that needs to be taken into account. You have ways that you need to to test across things. It will not really understand everything you're saying to it. So, so it is it is very exciting, but there's also sort of a a word of caution to not uh, um, to not think that all of a sudden you know code is going to be a be a non-issue, right? You're you're going to be able to write code faster, but the process of of turning an idea into working code in production is is much more than just um, the initial creation of uh, of some draft code. Um, yeah, so. and I mean, before we get into the potential challenges, you know, if you're thinking about is this something we should start to think about for uh, my team, you know, some of the metrics that you can tie to this is, you know, I've worked with a number of of customers who are looking at automation because they have a huge backlog, right? They've got an increasing yeah. number of business requests, and they're simply not able to produce those features fast enough. Um, and oftentimes, the bottleneck is actually their development. It's not their testing. It's not their design process. It's the development itself. They either don't have enough developers, they don't have enough money to hire you know, tens and tens of, of part-time consultants to code it. Um, so the productivity gain could could mean a much faster time to value for features that your business is requesting, a much faster uh, user story production rate. And and really, <laughs> that's where we start to get into, you know, those, those cautions, uh, the potential challenges associated with this. Um, the first thing that comes to mind in the context of DevOps is, it's wonderful if we can move that fast. It's wonderful if we can, you know, take a user story and be able to use AI to uh, have our developer, you know, put some prompts in there and get 80 to 90, if not 100% of the code immediately. But, you know, if you've got a team of 10 developers, 12 developers, and everyone's productivity is all of a sudden doubled or tripled, you're going to end up with a lot of code and features that need to be run through the tests the 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 checks and balances, the UAT testing, the QA testing, the functional tests, all of the tests that you want to make sure that this is not going to uh, put poor architecture into your code base, all that still needs to be done. And it needs to be done even more granularly than before because the employee themselves did not write it, right? The they the AI did. So them reviewing it and all of the layers in between reviewing it before it hits production becomes increasingly important, uh, which will continue to talk about. Um, one of the first things that, that uh, Lars, I heard you touching on right before this was the, the unreliable results. Um, do you mind talking a little bit about your experiences with, I guess, just AI hallucinations and libraries? And I mean, just how that code looks as it comes out? Yeah, but I mean, uh, that, that's uh, sort of one of the, the core problems that everybody knows about, right? You know, these mm -hmm. language models, they make things up. Right. They, the, you know, I used, I used the GPT to generate quite a lot of code myself, uh, both in Python and in, uh, in Apex and in JavaScript. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, it is fine. Right. But um, every now and again, especially when you ask it for something that it doesn't uh, really know what, how to do, if you're asking for something that's, you know, not something that it can just readily generate. Um, it will just make things up, right? I have had the scenario in uh, in Python, for instance, that I uh, wanted to connect to a particular cloud provider and um, clearly it didn't have a good example of, uh, of how to do that. So what it did was it made up a Python library that did that thing, right? It just, um, you know, it, it made a completely fictional library. It made code that called that completely fictional library um, and then uh, then provided that code to me to, to, to try to, to uh, 
to use. And you know, obviously, it didn't work because there is no library that does what it uh, what it purported, purported to do. So that sort of stuff you you get. And um, I mean, that sort of underscores the kind of of due diligence that you do need to have with uh, with these models, right? They are not one hundred percent reliable. Um, they're not going to follow your coding and architecture standards. Uh, you can't be sure they're not going to introduce uh, bad performance or anti-patterns um, into your code base. Um, all of that stuff, you're still going to have to to validate yourself, right? Um, and I mean, that's kind of also why I would caution about being too optimistic about the, the productivity benefits, because yes, you are going to really resolve the, 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 the developer um, bottleneck, right? That's not going to be the bottleneck anywhere. And it is a, is a bottleneck for, for many com companies at the moment. But that bottleneck potentially just moves um, another place, uh, moves, moves to another place in the, the total pipeline, right? Whether that's a code review or um, validation or testing, um, because you're going to have to spend more effort there to make sure that, uh, that what uh, gets produced actually lives up to the standards uh, and the quality level that you need it to. Right. That's it's an excellent point, Lars, because really we're just moving the constraint, right? If uh, so, thinking about your team right now, is the developer productivity the issue? Because if it's not, then you're simply going to like you're not really going to be solving any problem, right? You still have the constraint on your testing side. You still have the constraint on on UAT or, or maybe your deployments have too many manual steps involved. Whatever that may be, uh, there may be other layers of automation that need to be addressed in order for you to really see the gains from something like this. Uh, even some of the teams that I'm working with that are that are very uh, cutting edge and trying to apply these things, teams of you know 25 to 200 developers where they want to be able to produce more faster, they are still having to address um, their testing pipeline and what their DevOps pipeline looks like post, you know, uh, user story creation, post uh, development, after they get out of VS code, then what happens? Um, so static code analysis becomes uh, imperative. Again, ask yourself, are you currently using static code analysis? And if so, how good is it? Because a simple Apex PMD scan or, you know, a scan of like a generic scanning tool is not really going to find much uh, as it relates to Salesforce vulnerabilities, bugs, architecture issues. Uh, you really need something that's going to go through it with a fine tooth comb and can actually apply your, you know, custom standards to, uh, to checking that code. Um, what types of automation, you know, around like uh, things like Selenium scripts, right? We're seeing folks use that uh, a ton. So just what are you doing for test automation uh, and how good is it, right? Not just are you doing it, a lot of regulatory. Um, I work with a, a ton of regulated industries, you know, in healthcare, banks, and oftentimes once they reach a certain size, they have a regulatory requirement to scan things. They have a regulatory requirement to say, we are scanning this before it goes into production or we're scanning it while it's in production. Um, and they'll often just get kind of the, the, the enterprise available tool that's already at their company, or they'll, you know, grab something free like Apex PMD and they'll say, oh, look, we're scanning, we're meeting the regulatory requirement. But later on, you know, when they do a more thorough analysis, they find that it's been insufficient. And now they've, they're dealing with a ton of technical debt in a world where you've just accelerated your pace of development. You've just, you know, poured the water into your boat faster, right? You, you've just made the problem worse much faster. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that, right? It's uh, I use the standard rule set in uh, in in PMD, and I think that's going to be uh, be good enough to to scan through whatever the AI produces. I'm now producing, you know, 500 user stories. Um, I'm I'm using the same level of static code analysis, um, which is not at all checking for the kind of quality issues that we we're discussing before in terms of performance, uh, general anti patterns, and so on and so forth, you can mess up your code base in production very quickly and get to a really nasty result. So um, yep. that is a caution. Yeah, it's absolutely right. So look at things like Provar, look at things like code scan, look at things like XLQ, look at things that are going to automate testing, particularly on the code side, you know, code scan, but as you get into uh, more functional testing, um, Provar, XLQ are, are great options there. One thing I want to talk a little bit about here is the security and compliance as we talk about those those challenges, maybe not so much with the code, but more so much with uh, the architecture and, and what's happening with this AI. There's a lot of unanswered questions here uh, that, that Lars and I don't even know the answers to, but 
but naturally regulators will be asking. Uh, and that is, where is this, where is, what happens to the code, right? When you say, hey, I'd like for you to uh, build me, you know, this, this thing, Mr. AI or uh, JetGPT, what happens to that code? If that code is then stored in some public repository or that code, it, like what happens to that code? You know, if that code ends up being in your production instance of your company, that is that is all of a sudden a, a security risk, right? Because your code is not only living in your production, but it's also living in perhaps some open source environment. Um, what happens to the questions that you ask it? Right? Uh, are those questions stored anywhere? What happens? Uh, we've seen a number of cases already where uh, AIs, uh, particularly ChatGPT, are being asked questions um, that they're not supposed to know the answer to about location data, about uh, sensitive information about the platform, and people, you know, will spend their entire day or week trying to figure out how can I ask this a question that's going to get it to reveal this information. So using something like ChatGPT for a potentially sensitive use case or just a sensitive tech stack or even something completely benign and then allowing that code to be used in your production environment, that's where you're going to get a ton of vulnerabilities, potentially, potentially. We don't know. Um, Lars, I'm curious to your thoughts on this. I know we were both kind of yeah, <laughs> not I mean, sure. It, 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 is, it is a little bit because we know a lot of this isn't obviously public information, right? So we know that we can mitigate some of these concerns by using the the private endpoints in in Asia that Microsoft uh, make available uh, to to uh, sort of get a hold of the the open AI API. So you know if you if you're doing it at an enterprise scale, you you probably wanna you wanna use that kind of mechanism where at least there is a level of control and it's a it's a private connection and there's a and uh, and terms and conditions that say they're not gonna use your uh, your prompts and your code for uh, for further training, um, but you're right. I mean, we have obviously seen instances where people have used the the public version of ChatGPT, for instance, where the data that you put in will be used to to train it and optimize it, um, and that has led to uh, to data leaks. Right, that has happened. Um, also, I think a more worrying concern is you know this is trained on a vast store of effectively public information, right? It's a, it gets all its code, code from Git, GitHub, right? And if it learns from GitHub that a particular pattern is the right way of solving a particular type of problem, and that um, that problem turn, that, that approach turns out to have a security, security vulnerability, then everybody who's generated that type of code with uh, with ChatGPT is likely to, to be now subject to that uh, security vulnerability. So we're gonna see systemic risks that are um, you know, unprecedented because, you know, it's not going to be tied to like log4j or something like that, where it's going to be genuinely all sorts of different uh, scenarios where people have just used uh, similar kinds of code patterns and similar kinds of prompts. Uh, so that, that, you know, that's conceivable. Um, another issue is obviously what's called prompt injection, right? Where somebody like effectively spikes um, BitHop uh, repositories or, or similar in a in a particular way, uh, with uh, prompt instructions for a large language model that uh, that makes it misbehave in various ways, and that you know that's a kind of security vulnerability that actually we don't have a good answer to yet, right? People are working on it, but there isn't a a definitive answer. So there 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 is there there is cause for concern. I wouldn't you know overplay it, right? If you mm -hmm. if you use private endpoints, you know it's it's well secured within uh, within your environment. You've got uh, sort of solid policies around what what and when people are allowed to use these uh, these models, you're probably going to be okay, but it is definitely not something that you should uh, just leave. Yes, yes, absolutely right, Larson. Depending on your business, probably okay, maybe fine. Um, for some of the, particularly for a lot of the regulated folks I work with, probably okay is is almost never an okay answer. So they <laughs> they want they say static code analysis through and through. I want on prem architecture. I want this. I want that. So some of these things we just don't know the answer to just yet. Um, but again, if you're thinking about your team right now and how you're going to apply uh, ask the you know answer these questions in the future really start looking at your static code analysis for how you're automatically evaluating code vulnerabilities uh, and then looking at your automated testing for how you uh, prevent the constraint from just moving forward. Yeah, uh, I think that's fair. I mean, probably don't use it in public sector or financial services right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're in B2B sales, maybe it's fine. But Yeah. 
Quite right. Uh, implementation difficulties. This is one piece that right now we're not entirely sure how this will be applied in a DevOps pipeline, right? Right now, uh, I'm seeing individual developers uh, play around with it. Um, some managers have given directives, hey, don't use this at all. We just don't know the implications. Other managers say, you know, uh, hey, I'm going to figure out exactly how this is going to work for us, and then I'll push a policy down. Um, but again, as we think about where this is going to be a challenge for DevOps teams, I think it's how do we deal with a pace that is increased uh, without also increasing the breaks, right? So this is I feel like AI is is like adding a jet engine to your development pipeline, right? You're all of a sudden able to go much faster in a perfect world, right? AI has, is actually able to, you know, do everything we want it to perfectly. Even right now, it can accelerate development, but it's adding this fuel that makes you go much, much faster, produce user stories, produce features much faster. But what about the brakes to that vehicle, right? Do you have the ability to slow down when that time comes? Uh, most DevOps pipelines, the answer is probably no. So having things like a very clearly defined DevOps process with quality gates uh, throughout that will actually prevent something from moving forward if it is violated a compliance policy, right? Which is not something ChatGPT is thinking about your personal, your compliance policies. Um, if it has any type of uh, known bug or vulnerability, uh, some type of architecture issue that that is going to create tech debt in your code base, uh, those types of things have to be uh, automatic within your DevOps pipeline if you plan on accelerating your pipeline delivery with AI. Yeah, no, I know. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, to be honest, if you don't, if you start adopting this at scale, then, and you don't have a mature DevOps pipeline with a lot of automation, it's probably going to break. Like your process is going to break. You're just going to get end up with huge, um, huge buffers at particular points in the process, and uh, and people are going to start getting getting upset. And I think to to some extent, like this is a bit of a snowball, right? Because it, even if you put some constraints around it, adoption, you're probably going to start seeing individual developers using it on their own because it's going to increase their own productivity right so so it's it's kind of very hard to put a, a break on the initial step unless you you know really want to police how people do their work um right. so it's it's kind of it's a hard problem to avoid even if you say okay we're good we want to we want to wait and see and we want to slow things down that's actually quite hard to do uh given the availability of these technologies and the and the fact that people can gain individual advantage from using them right yeah then you know, as we get into, you know, okay, how how should we safely address this? Um, the first thing that that I'd I'd like to kind of go off of our challenges that we talked about around testing, around uh, not having enough quality gate automation, is the the best thing that we can do because none of us really know where AI is going to turn next or how exactly this is going to look in six, twelve, eighteen months. But we do know that it's going to speed things up. It's going to speed up the delivery of your features, your user stories. It's going to make everyone work faster, uh, particularly your developers who are writing code and your admins uh, who are making configuration changes. We're already starting to see some of that stuff come down the pipeline as well, is improve your DevOps pipeline. Right? You need to get your DevOps pipeline into a more automated state and into a more refined state so that when this does really hit the mainstream and when you know it, there's no more waiting and your developers and admins are going to be using these tools, you have the process and the, and the, the pipeline in place so that that increase in speed is not going to break you a couple months in with Thinking about it, you know, for some of the teams that I've talked with that, you know, have decided to just go a route of, hey, we're just going to have, you know, a couple of Jenkins scripts and try to maintain them. Um, unless you have, you know, multiple people working on that DevOps pipeline at all times as their full time role, it's going to be really challenging to get the level of automation you're going to want for something like this. Um, we've already talked about a few of those, but when it comes to being prepared, uh, strengthening your DevOps pipeline uh, is is the most important thing you can do, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that, right? It is uh, it is velocity, right? You need to be able to hand, handle a higher velocity if you want to take advantage of that. And to be honest, you know, if you don't want to handle higher velocity, 
then you basically need to scale down your your development team and and just do you know like fit the fit the input to to what you can actually handle right those are the that's probably not a not a way that most companies would want to go um so given that that that's not what you want to do like your your only real alternative is to then then figure out how can we make the whole pipeline faster um given that we now have this uh, effectively not unlimited capacity but much faster capacity to to to, to produce um code at the at the input stage um, yeah so I don't think yeah, that that I, I would entirely agree with that. And obviously, I mean, to some extent, the AI can can also help with some of that, right? You, we will be seeing AI AI applied to do uh, code review, static code analysis, um, you know, write tests, uh, you know, write uh, Selenium scripts, and so on and so forth. But then, you know, it's kind of a, a never-ending circle because then we need to need to validate the tests and the and the, and the work it does it does in these areas, right? So you're not gonna <laughs> you're not gonna gonna completely automate your way out of it, but but you can do you can do things to make it faster, right? Yes, you're right. And for those wondering, there are some some things like that on the horizon, um, but we haven't heard anything that's gone GA yet as far as testing with AI or AI for remediation uh, of these issues in Salesforce. <clears throat> but not to be you know too redundant, but when I think about the the training for the team members and ensuring that your team is properly prepared and communicated uh, to deal with this wave as well, I think it does really go back to the DevOps, right? You're you're not going to have uh, ten different meetings on AI. Uh, that that sounds a bit wasteful, but what you can do is you can have tight DevOps processes and tight automation and tight controls, uh, which are built into your development practices. If you're trying to apply those when you know AI is already widespread and all your developers are using it, you know you're going to be trying to build the train tracks as the train is is barreling down the road. But if you can implement a lot of those DevOps practices now, uh, automate much of your pipeline now, uh, and your team has been running like that for a few months, then it's going to be a lot easier to deal with that increased velocity. So I, I do think it goes back to the DevOps automation and training your team to be comfortable with that process. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly think it has to be right now. If you're if you're looking at at th at this hitting, right? You, if you look at the big vendors, Salesforce, Microsoft, so on and so forth, they're all going GA with their GPT offerings over the course of 2023, right? They haven't set dates, but it will be months. So, if you want to prepare for it, you really have to start now. Otherwise, it is just going to hit you at some point. Yeah, it's exactly right. And I think just the last slide we've got here is, is again, reiterating, use DevSecOps tools as guardrails, um, use static code analysis, use test automation, use a automated uh, development uh, uh, DevOps tool so that you aren't going to have to try and catch all of these things manually. Um, because that's really the the position folks are going to be in is is trying to you know keep up with tens and tens of of user stories and many hundreds or thousands of lines of code uh, that are going into their system because all of a sudden everyone can work more productively the business is not going to care about your hey you can't move you, you don't have great DevSecOps pipeline well these developers are telling me they can crank out these user stories so they're going to want the features um, and it's going to be really hard for uh, us to manage expectations. So get some DevSecOps tools in place uh, and start that implementation sooner rather than later so that when things get to the point where it's all GA, you are in a great spot to take advantage. Agreed. That is all we have for today's presentation. Uh, we saw one or two questions come into the chat, um, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A section and we'll start there. Great. Thanks so much, Zach. Thanks, Lars. That was really, really insightful. A lot to think about there. Um, I think especially with the with the security aspect, but it is pretty amazing to see how far the um the the tech world has come in AI and what I think it was November, was it? Chat GPT was, was announced and it's it's all anyone yeah. can speak about. Um and and yeah, pretty amazing that we we you know developers or, or non-developers can essentially code now um, by just using this tool. So if you have any um, uh, any questions, please put them in the chat now, and we'll try and get around to as many as possible. Let's just have a look here. Um, 
There's mm. one, uh, well, yeah, one, one's just come in. The one I was just about to ask has come in again. Um, I suppose we could expand this question, but the question is, um, are we as developers, should, be, should we be worried about AI taking over? Um, but I suppose maybe we could, we could expand that and talk a bit about the different Salesforce roles in the ecosystem and if people should be worried. Um, who wants to take that first? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, go ahead, Lars. Okay. I, I mean, I I would not be overly worried um, because, I mean, my, the, the experience, I think, has been that when we've got better development tools in the past, like, you know, um, high-level languages, uh, scripting languages, we've moved to the to the web. What what tends to happen more than developers being replaced is that we do more with technology, right? We get better tools. We uh, have um, have more stories. Uh, we have uh, more refinement on the stories. So, um, my guess would be that most of this um, productivity increase is actually gonna gonna go into uh, doing more with uh, with technology rather than than replacing developers. Um, that will that would be my uh, my my guess. Now mm -hmm. it will change the role of the developer uh, because you know a lot of the time we're not we are no longer going to be creating code from scratch, right? We're going to be we have an existing code base, we have some requirements, we have an AI. We're going to combine those things uh, to produce some kind of draft code, and then we're going to be iterating on that to make it work within our um, our environment. Um, so that's it's a different flow. Um, like the, the 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 sitting down in front of a, a blank screen and just writing a program from from scratch is going to be less common, right? So that would be yeah. my my initial response. Yeah, Lars, I think is right there. Um, there's there's definitely various opinions on this matter. Um, there's the more optimistic point of view, which is that you know uh, AI will simply uh, enable all existing developers to work faster and work better. It'll be like a perfect spell checker and something that also writes, does a lot of the grunt work for you. Um, <clears throat> in the other vein and, and a prediction I've seen some people make, uh, and again, I don't really have an opinion on this matter, but uh, what some people talk about is a world where currently professionals of all sorts, not just developers, will be uh, made 10x more productive by tools like this. And if people are 10x more productive, then really the the upper echelon of developers or the upper echelon of insert profession here will be able to get more productive than they ever were before and replace many of the 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 less productive folks or the the less talented or whatever you want to say. So there's there's kind of both an optimistic and a pessimistic point of view. Uh, which one will be true? How does this all play out? Uh, I'm not really sure. I think that's that's kind of uh, your own decision. Yeah, great responses. Thanks, guys. I, I know we're we're exploring ways we can utilize AI within sales for spend to to write content. And so far, the results have been really good. But at, at no point are we seeing in the near future AI replacing anyone's jobs. It's just making making people more effective at researching and generating content. So I, I think you know we'll we'll start to see similar trends across across other roles as well, and definitely in the Salesforce ecosystem. Um, so we have a question here from from Vernon. Hi, Vernon. Um, do you think these tools will increase alignment of Salesforce investments with enterprise goals? Do we think that these tools will increase alignment of Salesforce investments with enterprise goals? I want to make sure I understand the question correctly. Ben, maybe I know Vernon can't hop on the microphone just yet. He, he, can, he can clarify. Um, I, I think what he's getting up there is, is you know, companies will implement for... Uh, in, uh, companies will implement Salesforce for various reasons. Will will AI help uh, companies reach those goals? Um, mm. Yeah, with their with their Salesforce investment. Right. I I do think it increases time to value. So to maybe tie your question to a metric, uh, if AI enables implementations, and uh, you know, say you were to 
you know, purchase a managed package, uh, then what you can say is, hey, normally this implementation would be taking, you know, four months. Normally it would take us two months three weeks to produce this feature that you want as a business. But with the power of ChatGPT allowing us to develop all of this custom code in a matter of days as opposed to weeks, and with some AI's help in the testing of this, we can get this uh, version one to you in, you know, 10 business days. That I think is where we're going to see alignment with your business stakeholders and more technical stakeholders uh, is allowing them to understand how this can impact you from, uh, from a, you know, feature delivery and, and speed to, to value. Yeah, I'm going to be a little bit more pessimistic there and say it will allow you to 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 get uh, get faster to value if uh, the process that you're following is actually leading you to value. But unfortunately, as as we know, not all Salesforce implementations go well. And uh, if you've got a process that's actually not that well aligned with the business goals that you're buying Salesforce for, as is often the case, um, then it's just going to let you go faster down the wrong path, right? Uh, then you end up being much faster at uh, delivering a, uh, a Salesforce implementation that actually wasn't what you needed in the first place. So um, is that better or worse? It may be better if it means we can uh, we can then uh, have more time to, to redo it, but um, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't change the fundamentals of Salesforce implementations. Um, and actually someone on LinkedIn today actually put one of our Salesforce admin practice exams we've got on our Salesforce Ben site through chat GPT and it scored 53% out of out of a uh, out of 100 so you know mm. it's definitely not there yet on on the technicalities of Salesforce yeah there's uh one question i saw here ben that came in from finn that i wanted to answer um finn rakow thanks for the question here uh he's asking you know will developers want slash like to use ai to generate their code, I would have assumed that coding is half the fun. Uh, Finn calling out that uh, he himself is not a developer, but you know, virtually every developer that, that I work with, um, they'll tell me, why would I build something if I don't have to, right? From a, you know, there are certainly some uh, from a consulting perspective that, you know, they want to increase their billables. So yeah, they'll write something custom because it'll take longer. But in reality, most developers don't want to do extra work if they don't have to. They're creative puzzle solvers that want to find the easiest route to the best and right answer. So while coding may be something that they find great pride in, that doesn't mean that they want to write a thousand lines of code when they could write a hundred. So in my experience, the developers that I've spoken to, they're always looking for ways to, you know, either use something that's open source that they can find, uh, if if that's applicable or if that's possible or secure in their sense, uh, or use something like ChatGPT to write half or more of the code for them. I would like to answer this question um, with a quote from Larry Wall, who was the the inventor of the the Perl programming language. And he says that the three great virtues of a programmer are laziness, impatience, and hubris, right? <laughs> and I think that is, uh, being a developer myself, I think that uh, that is true in, in many cases. So if we look at the, at AI, it uh, definitely caters to, to laziness because I don't have to write all the boilerplate code. It definitely caters to impatience because it lets me do things faster. And it definitely caters to hubris because it allows me to attempt much more ambitious uh, programming projects. So I actually, I would expect that most programmers like like myself uh, will be quite fond of these tools. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've heard mainly good things to be fair. I haven't heard a lot of developers saying, I never wanna use JetGPT, I wanna write all my own code. Great, thanks guys. And um, we've got another one here from some of the anonymous. Can you also suggest some of the AI tools we can use to toy around with and get get hands on for DevSecOps? Mm -hmm. um, first, I'd I'd say from the AI perspective, definitely ChatGPT for the uh, code production uh, if you want to create code. And then from the DevSecOps perspective, uh, we had uh, another question come in with this as well about recommending DevOps tools um, from a Automation standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm a little biased here, but I mean, the the options on the market, AutoRabbit is going to give you generally the most functionality and the most configurability. Uh, so whatever applications that you have and however many release paths you want to do, uh, 
however much automation you want to bake into it, uh, it's going to be able to do it, right? It's going to be able to automate a lot of the manual steps you're doing right now as far as data loads, uh, things you have to do with chain sets, um, manually mapping things, uh, using Excel spreadsheets, you know, everything that's manual, uh, we see a lot of that automated in OtterRabbit uh, and a lot of other tools do some of that automation, but will really put your DevOps process in a box. This is the way our tool does it. You go through step one through eight, and that is the only way you will ever do it for the rest of your company's history. Uh, OtterRabbit has a more flexible approach to that. So that's, that's one that we can recommend as well. Great, thanks Zach. Um, if you have any more questions, we have a little bit of time left if anyone on the webinar wants to ask them. If you see any others that you'd like to look off, guys, feel free to pick them up. There's one for you there, Zach. Is there an auto rabbit dev account or trial from Fernando? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for code scan, we offer code scan for uh, you can run that 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 scan for free to see what it de it detects in your code base as far as vulnerabilities, bugs, technical debt, things like that. Um, so that is that is a pretty much instant trial you can use for code scan for free. For uh, AutoRabbit, the actual uh, ARM tool, Automated Release Manager, that's our our CI CD pipeline. That one is a little bit more involved, so we usually don't just uh, hand over the keys to that. Um, we'll have to talk to you about your use cases first and, and understand what you need it for and where we should apply it before we think about a POC. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to get involved in that, feel free to drop a line to me on LinkedIn or uh, just jump on our website. I'll get back to you. All right. Great. Thank you. There's, there's one that's actually just come in the, in the chat from uh, Ram Nikhil, uh, any standard prompts which we can use in chat GBT when it comes to Salesforce development to achieve standard code practices? So what you can do there, and it works reasonably well, is you can insert um, basically bullet point lists of, uh, of Apex best practices uh, that you can take from developers at salesforce.com, for instance, um, or equivalent for, for Lightning, uh, Lightning Web Components. And it will somewhat respect that when it uh, when it writes the code. You can also simply tell it to use best practice, and it will be a little bit better than if it didn't. Neither of those two approaches work perfectly, and there is uh, a problem with context length, especially if you're working with the web version, because there's only so and so much text you're allowed to paste in. That's a little bit better if you use the API, but most people don't have access to the API yet. So. Um, the answer is you can do a little bit um, that will will improve it somewhat. It's not perfect, and um, until we get uh, sort of much larger context length models where we can uh, can sort of put in more or less our entire guidance, it's not likely to be. But that will come. I'm sure it will. Things are happening very fast at the moment. Um, Great. I'll I'll just give it a second just to see if there's any more questions coming in. Um, but if not, um, I'd just like to say thank you very much for attending today. Um, it was a real pleasure for, for me to listen to Zach and Lars have that conversation. So hopefully it was for you as well. But thank you very much for spending your morning, evening or afternoon with us. Um, Zach, Lars, before we break up, any any final words? We'll come to you first, Zach. Yeah, real quick, this is on the horizon. We all know that it's coming. AI is, AI is here to stay. Uh, and we're going to see it touch a lot of different industries and a lot of different areas of our life. Salesforce is certainly going to be one of them. Uh, as it relates to Salesforce developers, get ready. Get ready to have uh, a lot of your code written by an AI, and then you're basically tweaking and testing it. Um, start playing around with that stuff now so you can be literate and familiar with it. Uh, don't get caught off guard by this stuff because you thought it was coming too much later. Uh, DevSecOps tools, get that stuff started now to avoid getting blindsided from a team and an enterprise perspective. All right. Thanks so much. And Lars, yourself? Yeah, I mean, that just want to largely echo what uh, Zach is saying. I think the most important thing is start using it now. 
start using it for your day job, start using it for, um, you know, your, your, your hobbies, like learn how, how to use these tools to, to produce code, to produce text, uh, to, to answer questions. Um, it's going to be embedded into everything. And the sooner you learn how to interact with it and use it productively, um, the better it's going to be for you because it's not, you know, it is just going to be rolled out every, and, and will be everywhere and it is not going to take very long. Um, so ultimately, the best thing you can do right now is simply start using it for whatever use case you've got. Um, obviously, you know, while complying with your company's policies, but uh, um, even if you can't use uh, internal data, then, you know, do it for your test projects, do it for your, your private projects. Uh, learn. Yeah. Great advice. Get stuck in. Well, again, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And hopefully we'll see you very soon. Take care. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Thank you.